So I found the pen. I have to use a special kind of pen. Oh, you do? Okay, yeah, great. because it smears uh, badly. Well, hey, thank you. Who should I make it out to? Bob. Okay, we're ready to begin. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Center for Transportation Studies Friday Transportation Seminar. And uh, along with my colleagues, Chris Monsier and John Gleedy, and Jennifer Dill and Miguel Filiazzi, I'm Rob Bertini, and we're happy to welcome you to this uh, seminar where we're very glad to have Sharon Wood Warren, the author of the Portland Bridge book. She's going to be talking about, guess what? Bridges. Bridges, yes. Bridges and it's a, a personal uh, pleasure for me because um, the reason I got into transportation was my fascination with bridges growing up near San Francisco, visited the Golden Gate Bridge many times. So the idea of uh, bridges and what they mean to us, to our city and our, our society is very important. So with that, Sharon Wood Workman, and she, will be, she and her books will be available after the seminar in the in the atrium for uh, signing. So welcome, yes, Sharon. You're welcome. Yes. Um, how many of you are familiar with my book or have heard of it? See, it always amazes me. I always think everybody would have heard about my book, but maybe not. So I just want to talk about the book first of all, a little bit. Um, when I was Sharon Wood, the Oregon Historical Society published this edition in 1989. And then in um, 1991, I began leading bridge walks for Portland Parks and Outdoor Recreation. And I began doing classes with third graders and taking children bridge walking. How many of you know that bridges are taught as part of third grade social studies curriculum in Portland? So every year, 3,700 third graders are taking a look at bridges. I didn't know that when I wrote this book. So in um, 93, I started teaching summer classes for OMSI. And in the fall of that year, I walked to the top of the arch on top of the Fremont Bridge to do some research. Um, and when I got up there, well, that's another story. I'll tell you what happened when I got up there in a little bit. So um, I did interview the iron worker who had worked, or excuse me, the, I did interview the iron workers, but I interviewed the uh, bridge engineer the structural engineer who had worked with the iron workers to put the Fremont Bridge together in 1973. Thank you. And then when the bridge turned 20 years old, I called the Oregonian and asked them if I could write a $100 story. I would have liked more, but they always just pay $100. So they said, sure. So I interviewed um, Ed Wartman, and um, we got married in 1998. So what I know is that bridges... <laughs> Bridges can lead you places that you don't expect to go. And um, on our first date, he took me to the footings of the Fremont Bridge. Now, I don't know what kind of exciting first date you've ever been on, but he took me, and you can go there too. I take tons of kids there. You just go out NATO Parkway, and at 1750, there's a parking lot. You pull in there, and there are the shoes or the bearings on the west side of the Fremont Bridge. So he took me up there, and I actually touched where 7,500 tons of gravity goes into the ground. Be still, my heart. <laughs> so the Fremont Bridge is just like the human body. You know, our gravity goes into the ground through our feet, and so does that bridge. Two bearings on the east side and two on the west. Well, Ed really got me excited about looking at the environment in a different way. And he also showed me where, across NATO Parkway, the Fremont Bridge had cracked a whole tie girder and almost fell down across NATO. So then I thought, wow, that's cracks been there all this time, but you didn't really know about it. So after that, that's what I started doing on my bridge walks. I started interpreting the environment in a new way. So this slideshow began when I did a slideshow for Multnomah County a few years ago, and it's developed over time. Um, I think I have to be done. Tell me what time I have to be done, Dr. Bertini. I have 1 o'clock, and then do we question and answer after that? Okay, so I have a little time. So I think uh, because you guys are, how many of you are engineers? You're, a lot of you are. Well, this will be good. Okay, so I mean, I really have to get my stuff straight today, I guess. All right. I do want to talk about definitions. And just because you're engineers doesn't necessarily mean maybe you're an expert about bridges. Um, back in the 1960s and 70s, bridges were falling down in the United States. Lots worse accidents than what happened in Minneapolis. The Silver Bridge in Maryland fell down. 43 people were killed. 
a lot of problems going on. So the federal government mandated an inspection system and they implemented their sufficiency ratings for the first time. So bridges had to be looked at and inspected by the local agencies and the federal government ran the program. Every two years, a bridge, meeting their definition of a bridge, has to be inspected every two years. And their definition of a bridge is any span or structure across an opening 20 feet or greater. So that's a bridge. I don't know what they call it if it's 20 feet or less. 20 feet or later, it's a bridge. And they found out some pretty amazing thing. Anybody here born in Texas? Anybody know anybody from Texas? <laughs> All right. Look how many bridges in Texas. This is pretty amazing. 20 feet or greater, highway, not railroad, not forest service, not pedestrian. 50,000 bridges in Texas. I mean, I don't think about Texas and bridges, but the truth is most bridges are part of interstate highway systems, okay? And because Texas has the largest, it has the most bridges. 6,700 bridges in Oregon, and in the whole United States, how about this? 600,000 highway bridges. I'm working on a new book, and um, I, have a, I have an exercise in that book, and the exercise is you go up Broadway, just past Jackson, and you get on the I-5, and you loop Portland. I've done this with children in big yellow school buses, third graders, and I say, how long is it going to take us? And they say, all day. <laughs> So how long does it take to drive from the Fremont Bridge to the Markham Bridge in a yellow school bus when it's not rush hour? Five minutes. Actually, it takes about seven and a half, okay? And you go six and a half miles, and how many bridges do you count? Now, wait just a minute. <laughs> how many bridges will you count that your tires touch, go under, or you go on top of? in that six and a half mile loop. I invite you to do it. You guys are right here by it. Only you need somebody to do the counting while you're driving. Any ideas? 20 feet or greater in that loop? There are 52 bridges out there. So in the whole 600,000 bridges, and those 52, and what we have here in Portland, this unusual deep port inland river city, there are only three main bridge types and three main movable bridge types. So wherever you go, it's going to be one of three types. So you guys, I know, I'll get my engineers to help me. What are the main bridge types? Suspension. Well, I did. I wasn't sure about this group, so I did bring the third grade slideshow. <laughs> okay, so suspension bridges. Only one in the Willamette Valley. Actually, only one major suspension bridge in Oregon. So you guys have all seen it, right? How many people have not seen the St. John's Bridge? Raise your hand. Oh, my gosh. You must see the St. John's Bridge. It is, I had one woman say, it's just not fair to the other bridges the way the St. John's is so beautiful. It's just not fair to those other bridges. So the only suspension bridge, it's at River Mile 6 on the Willamette just six miles upriver from Kelly Point Park where the Willamette meets the Columbia. That's the only suspension bridge in the Willamette Valley. Now we know suspension bridges are in suspension. And what's holding up a suspension bridge is the cable. And whenever I'm going on a suspension bridge, I always look around to see what's holding the cable up. In the case of the St. John's Bridge in Cathedral Park on the east side, there's an anchorage there, 29,000 tons and it's hollow. It's an amazing structure. So let's talk a little bit about how you measure bridges. You do not measure from one side of the river to the other. Otherwise, the longest bridge in Oregon would be Astoria at 4.3 miles. Where they measure bridges is between the piers. So this part here, St. John's Bridge main span is 1,200 feet. Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco, 4,200 foot suspension bridge. About 10 years ago, they started opening suspension bridges in Asia that have main spans of 6,000 feet. And they just signed a contract for a bridge across the Straits of Messina. A suspension bridge, 10,000 feet. 
So suspension bridges go across long bodies of water and they're, they're expensive. And that's why we don't have very many of them. Okay, suspension. What's another bridge type? Which kind? Causeway. Causeway. Well, that's a nice word. Let me come back to that. So suspension. What about this? What's this? What kind of bridge is that? Anybody know? Think Rome. Yes. Arch. So arch bridges are in compression. And then you have... Pardon me? That includes arches above or below. Right. In fact, the arch bridge that we have, most arch bridges, I mean, a true arch would spring against canyon walls because the arch has to be kept in compression. We don't have canyon walls in Portland. So the Fremont Bridge is actually what's called a tied arch, T-I-E-D. And that means the bottom deck of the Fremont Bridge actually holds the arch together sort of like a tie, like, a, like an archer's bow. You know how you go like this? So same deal. So yeah, you can have deck trusses or through trusses and same way with arch bridges. Okay, probably the first bridge in the whole world was a tree. Two people need to get across the canyon and he said, honey, will you cut down that tree? And they walked across on a beam bridge. Okay, a truss bridge is a beam bridge, but now some of the steel has been cut away. So this becomes lighter and what's more important, it becomes less expensive. Fewer the materials, the less the bridge costs. I had an OMSI dad tell me once, he says, you know, Sharon, anybody can build a bridge that stands up, but it takes an engineer to design a bridge that will barely stand up. <laughs> so that's what you guys are going to do. I mean, you design bridges to barely stand up because it's all about the materials and the money you spend on them. So suspension arch, beam truss, those are your three types. Okay? And maybe a causeway bridge. I actually have a causeway bridge in my slideshow, so we'll take a look at that. So then you guys have seen uh, what's called a cable stayed bridge that has the tall pylons and they kind of look like harps. They're a combination between a suspension bridge and a beam bridge. How about the floating bridges in Seattle? What would its type be? Beam. Exactly. So that's pretty much it, wherever you're going to go on those 600,000 bridges. Okay, now, the hard part, bridge 102. Show me with your hands how bridges move. Yeah, got one of those. What do you got? Show me how, your, show me how it moves. Got one like that. What else? Got one like that. Okay, well, I think you guys got it. Okay. So uh, this is the only one I don't have a model of. What's this one called? Yeah, it's called... You guys are going to get the language anyway. Vertical lift. What bridges in Portland are vertical lifts? Hawthorne, steel. There's another one. Yes. And the interstate bridges. Those are all vertical lifts. Okay, and then we have this kind. I paid 40 bucks for this, and you wonder about the real thing. This is called a bascule bridge. Okay, French word, French word of the day. Bascule, French for seesaw. I have a permit that lets me take people into the Morrison Bridge, which is a bascule bridge. We go up in the operator's tower and we go down in this pit. We see gears, 36 feet tall counterweights, okay, big blocks that weighs a lot. I took third grade class from Brooklyn School down there and I told that class what that counterweight weighed and this kid's pulling on me and he's going, that's the same as 11 brachiosaurus dinosaurs. <laughs> so if you know what 11 brachiosaurus dinosaurs weigh, you know what the counterweight weighs in the Morrison Bridge, 950 tons. And the amazing thing, you know this work the county's been doing on the Burnside Bridge? The Burnside Bridge counterweight is twice as heavy as the Morrison Bridge's counterweight. 
opened in 1926. That's because if you drive across the bridges, especially the movables, you must pay attention to their lift spans and what they're made out of. The lift span on the Morrison Bridge, do you guys know that bridge? Ever go across it where you're kind of skating across there? Or where that woman in her Isuzu rodeo did a 360 and went over the harbor wall and went 60 feet into the Willamette River. Morrison Bridge grading has worn out. It is 50 years old. Multnomah County is going to fix that bridge. But they have no money for it now. So what I tell my children when they come to town is don't take the Morrison Bridge. And you especially don't take it when it's raining. And when it's too hot, because steel gets slippery when it's too hot. So the grading has worn off, and so people tend to go sliding across that bridge, which is what happened to a woman that was walking her dog across the bridge. SUV flew 100 feet to kill her. So I don't want to scare you about the Morrison Bridge, but I don't think it's a very good bridge. But that's where I take people walking. We don't go up there in the rainy weather, by the way. Multnomah County is going to start construction in the summer of 2008, to extend those sidewalks and make it safer for pedestrians up there. And they're waiting on the money to do the, to the grading. If you look at the Burnside Bridge, the main span that they've been working on is a solid concrete deck. And so that bridge has to have a larger counterweight because, remember the word seesaw goes up like this? Well, when this deck comes up, what's happening in this pit is there's a counterweight dropping down. So it goes just like this, okay? So what kind of bridge is that? Bascule. 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 All right, and then the oldest bridges. I just, I want to take this one back. I have the neatest old swing span. You just flip it and go around. This new one's not very good. This is a swing span. So where you'll see those, I think I have enough handouts for everybody in the room. I think it would be good. I'll give you, get this up there. you share those with those two tables? Let's turn this thing over and let's find bridge 5.1, also called BNS 5.1. Oh, I have to forget you. All right. So we're looking across the Willamette BNSF Railway Bridge 5.1, Cross the Oregon Slough BNSF Bridge 8.8, .8, and BNSF Bridge 9.6. Do you guys all see those there? Mm -hmm. So that's these bridges. Swing bridges. Railroad bridges. The oldest bridges on the Willamette, 1908. But they don't make them anymore. Why do you think they don't make them? They do wear out, but that's not the reason. You don't have much of a channel. Bridges opened in 1908, and all of a sudden you can't get the Titanic through them. It's just not going to go. All right, so Bridge 5.1, they took it out, the center span. And they made it into a vertical lift bridge in 1989. So if you're on NATO Parkway till it dead ends, you'll run in to a huge vertical lift bridge. Its center span is made out of weathering steel, and the approach spans are all pin connected because it's 1908. So they changed that out so they could open up the channel. But the other two are still there. I teach a class for Saturday Academy. We go down to Portland Union train station. We get on the train. And we go all the way to Vancouver, Washington. How long are we on the train? <laughs> 11 minutes. 11 minutes. So these numbers that you're looking at here, this 5.1, 8.8, 8, 9.6, what do you think they mean? Milepost from Portland Union Station. So on this new book I'm working on, I tell you how to take that train ride and go to Vancouver and get off and you sketch one of the largest swing bridges still in operation in the United States today. And I promise you it'll move while you're there because it's across the main channel of the Columbia River. And so there's lots of action there. All right, so those are the three main bridge types and a little bit about them. 
and where they are in Portland. So, any questions up till now? So we're on, are we on it? We're fifth, well I better add swing up there. So we got it? Yes. I'm curious about the swing bridge over the Pundy River. Yes. Um, what, they're planning to do, what they're planning to do with the swing bridge when they put the new Columbia River crossing bridge in. They have no plans. I, I know about that because I was at those meetings and there are no plans to do anything with that bridge at this point. Well, I don't know. Did you guys see the story in the paper about that bridge being a $4 billion bridge or some lot of money? Yeah. Okay, I don't really know any more than that. I heard there's nothing going to be happening right now. Okay, I have a couple of trays, but one just has a few slides in it. And I think it's worthwhile to show you what it takes to maintain bridges, especially in the Portland area. So I want to show you a little bit about, oh, i got to do this thing. I am not high tech. You can see that, right? But I'm working on it. Hey. Now, oh, I know, probably have to turn off a couple lights, do you think? Is that better? So this is a bridge on the National Road back east. And you can see what the problem is. It's wearing out. This is actually the uh, swing bridge at Vancouver train station. I don't know why that's there. Oh dear, it must be on that slide. So do you guys see how that works? So it swings open. What do you think the problem is here? This is called Spall. This is actually uh, a bridge pier in Chicago, back east. They use uh, salt for snow removal. Not very good for rebar. And we don't do that here in Portland or in Oregon. Uh, but salt is a problem. This is uh, the All Sea Bay Bridge, and they're blowing up the old bridge here because they lost it because of corrosion to that bridge. And the state implemented a program where they've saved the rest of them. This is the uh, Savia, or the excuse me, the uh, Selwood Bridge. How many people use the Selwood Bridge? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> this is down in Yamhill County. Earthquakes are not very good for bridges. And neither are floods. Floods, a bit, water's a big problem in Portland. These are the, uh, what's called the Starling, or the, um, oh, there's another word for those too. On the Burnside Bridge, that's one of Burnside's problems, is that in the 1996 flood, one of the Basquiat pits filled up with water and it floated one of those counterweights. So ships run into those st Starlings. How many people, what do you think bridges sit on in Portland Harbor? Yeah. Pilings? Pilings. Well, yeah. Um, actually, the especially the older bridges all sit on, the, the piers sit on what's called Douglas fir trees, pounded into the ground kind of like a pin cushion. And they put the piers on it and they put the bridge on it. There is no bedrock in Portland Harbor. And we know none of the bridges have been retrofitted for seismic except the Markham Bridge, and then only the main span. So if you're in an earthquake, you want to be on the main span of the Markham Bridge. You don't want to be on any of the approaches. What I tell when you know that thing I just showed you about the 52 bridges around Portland, I always tell people to enjoy Portland while it's here. This is the Burnside Bridge before they got the repairs going on that solid concrete deck. This is how they opened the Burnside Bridge till 1996. This panel is actually available. There's a bridge museum at the Oregon Department of Transportation, and you can go in there and you can pretend like you're opening the old Burnside Bridge. So technology is something that the bridges have to keep up with. Oh, here's the culprit. So what do you think? What do you think this means to bridges? Acid. That's exactly right. Bridges are a terrible problem here in Portland. Oh, what about this one? Any clues? I'll tell you a scary story. On this last book I was working on, I wanted to know how many registered vehicles were in my state when I was three years old. 
That was a long time ago. It was 1947. There were four, about 400,000 registered vehicles in Oregon. Guess how many registered vehicles in Oregon today? In my lifetime. Four million. Here's a scarier statistic. You know those Californians? You know, you've heard that, right? Well, in Oregon, we don't have four million people. We have more, more registered vehicles than we do people. But guess what? In California, that's not true. There are still more people in California than registered vehicles. Here's the bridge. Where's, where's this bridge? Anybody know this bridge? You should. People around here are paying for this bridge. This is the Savi Island Bridge, now being replaced. They're going to take this bridge out. This is a beautiful old truss bridge. Only 160 truss bridges left in Oregon. Truss bridges, steel truss bridges are disappearing. And they're going to put it in its place. These are the river piers, the approaches under construction. And they're going to float in that arch in November. It's made out of weathering steel. If you go down, um, what's that street? NATO that turns into Front Avenue, you can see the arch for the new bridge being constructed now. You did? What is that? They are. They are. It's supposed to be a big party, too. Um, I just want to say just a little bit about recycle. Um, in, turn this off for a minute. In 1999, this is a mouthful, the Historic American Engineering Record. Hair, H A E R, came to Portland and all the Laura Willamette River bridges were recorded for the Library of Congress. And some of those drawings are still at uh, Region 1, beautiful drawings, photographs. I was one of the full time historians. There were two full time historians and a half time historian. Six architects, a photographer, a photographer's assistant, big team. And um, they just thought that the bridges were so important that they be that they be recorded and photographed. So we learned a lot. I learned a lot about the three bridges built in the 20s, Selwood, Burnside, Ross Island. Um, county commissioners were found taking kickback money back then, and they booted them out, and they brought in this new guy. Well, before the commissioners left, their idea for Selwood, which was getting a new bridge in 1925, was to take the old Burnside Bridge, opened in 1996, you know, that's that, or 94, that's the first Burnside. And they said, let's take it up to Selwood. And I found these plans. This is at Multnomah County's, or I, excuse me, yes, Multnomah County's main branch of the library downtown in the rare book room. So this is the old 1894 Burnside. That's the swing span right there. And these are the approach spans right there. So this is what they were going to do at Selwood. We wouldn't be having the problems today if they'd have done that because those things wouldn't have lasted until today. <laughs> so who can say, you know? So they did. The, the new engineer that came in said, oh, that's a nice idea, but we're not going to do that. He said, we're going to take those old spans, and they eventually were sent out to Lusted Road and Bull Run. And that's those bridges, that's what you drive across when you go out there. You're going across the old 1894 Burnside. But he did take the engineer that came in, this famous, famous engineer, said, okay, we'll use parts of the 1894 Burnside, and we'll put those on the Selwood. So this will comfort you when you're going across the Selwood Bridge, that parts of the 1894 Burnside are on the bridge. Remember what I told you about uh, the federal government demanding inspections and giving the bridges sufficiency ratings? So what do you think the sufficiency rating is on the Selwood Bridge? Two. Two. Oh, you guys, I think the Multnomah County is doing so well with its publicity. So you already know that sad story. Beautiful, actually, very beautiful, pin-connected. Uh -huh. So uh, this was the steel bridge when it was a double-decker swing span before the one, we, the one we got today in 1912. And this is the Morrison Bridge. This is the old Morrison Bridge, 1905. This is the new one. This is a really wonderful picture because it explains why the Morrison Bridge doesn't connect with Morrison Street. They built the new bridge, took the other one down, and no more connection. 
just run by these engineers quickly. We have the most world famous bridge engineers came to Portland. This is John Waddell who invented the vertical lift bridge. Looks like he invented the curling iron. I love this picture. This guy's from Chicago. Gustav Linenthal, the ex New York commissioner of bridges, came to Portland in the 20s and built the last three bridges of his career. He also designed the Hellgate Arch and the Queensboro Bridge in New York City. Ralph Majeski, I'm sorry these slides aren't so great. Great bridge engineer from the Midwest who did the Broadway Bridge and those three 1908 bridges. If you look at the piers on Broadways, those are the same piers on the old railroad bridges. Granite from Index, Washington. You think this guy had an ego? This is a really famous engineer. This is David Steinman, who remodeled the Brooklyn Bridge in 18, uh, excuse me, 1948. And his bridge in Portland area is the beautiful St. John's Bridge. Also did the Mackinac Bridge. Now this guy, guess what bridge he, he designed in Portland. I love this. These engineers kind of look like they're designed. I'll give you a hint. When you look at the towers of this bridge, you have to guess whether they look more like airport landing towers or penitentiary towers. Do we know? Morrison. Who said Morrison? Exactly. They do. I mean, this was a Leif Sverdra and the Morrison Bridge opened in 1958 when they were doing a lot of designs of both those structures in the United States. Okay, let's see if I have anything else in here. Oh, people often say, oh, yes. The St. John's Bridge was the model for the Golden Gate Bridge. That's an urban myth. The only connection we have to the Golden Gate Bridge is that the Golden Gate Bridge was a Joseph Strauss Bridge. And at the Willamette Falls Locks in Oregon City, we have a little single span bascule designed by Joseph Strauss. And the opening mechanism on the Burnside Bridge is a Strauss bascule. But other than that, no connection. How are you guys doing? Sick of bridges yet? I got some good ones here. So you guys help me figure out where these bridges are. We're going to run through these really quickly. Where is this? Well, that kind of bridge is in Tacoma. Where? It is. This is the Leonard P. Zakem Bridge in uh, Boston, part of a $22 billion project. You guys know about that little bro road project in Boston. And um, they made this bridge so it emulated the Bunker Hill Monument. Where's this? Where? Chicago, exactly. Sears Tower. And look at this great old riveted bridge. Riveted bridges are going by the wayside. I took this picture. This is in West Virginia. This is a steep bridge, and this is one of the longest steel bridges in the United States. Do you guys know this bridge? New River Gorge. New River Gorge. They close it down one day a year for people to bungee jump <laughs> off it. I don't, I've heard that they bungee jump in, in southern Oregon someplace from a bridge, but I haven't found the bridge yet. Oh, Causeway. Okay, well, no, I wouldn't say this is a Causeway. Where is this? Well, this is the Confederation Bridge between Prince Edward Island, and I always forget what's on the other side, but it's in Canada. It's nine miles long, and I heard a wonderful story about this bridge. Does anybody here have Jephrophobia? G-E-P-H-Y-R-O, Jephrophobia. It's a real thing. Fear of bridges. Fear of bridges. Some people have it. I get them on my walks. It's not pretty. So, if you have Jephrophobia and you use this bridge, they will drive you across the river, nine miles. I thought that was so wonderful. I thought, gee, I wonder if they did that in Oregon. So I thought, hmm, the longest bridge. Hmm, Astoria, call ODOT. Talk to the guy there, and he goes, not around here, we don't. <laughs> I thought that was such an Oregon answer. Yeah, well, they, yeah, she, yeah. <laughs> She's been on one of my bridge walks. Right here, what's this? There's a tunnel under the water, yes. Chesapeake Bay and Tunnel Bridge. Have you guys seen this one? Yeah, the new one in France, the Mio Bridge. Let's see if you want to take care of the Mio Bridge. You think? How about this one? This looks like a joke. It's not. 
This is in Germany. This is the Magdeburg Bridge. It's a little bridge there for the sightseeing boats. And then you have the river underneath. This bridge. I'm very suspicious about this bridge because of the approach ramps. <laughs> this is in London. This is really a very historic, what's called a transporter bridge. This bridge dates to about 1908. So I want you to look at this bottom here. So this is uh, how they get across. So you drive on this little ferry and then it's got a rope attached and it just pulls you across. Engineers do amazing things. This is my, probably my favorite bridge. This for sure is my third grader's favorite bridge. This is in London. This is actually wider than it looks. This is a pedestrian bridge. Kind of like a pill bug. Should we see it again? Yeah, I think we have. One. Yeah. Amazing, huh? How about this? Married an engineer, and I said, that is a wonderful bridge. Don't you think? You know, it goes around there like that, and he goes, that's not a bridge. That's a porch. <laughs> so you guys, it's a porch or bridge. This is a bridge. As far as I'm concerned, anything that crosses 3,300 feet in 2 minutes 50 seconds going over four major roads, it's a bridge. It absolutely is. And you've all ridden on this, right? Everybody's done it. Well, if you, I have a way to tell you where you can ride it free, so see me afterwards. A uh, big thing happening in the United States are wonderful pedestrian bridges. This is in Arizona. Oh, you guys know the uh, sculpture in front of the engineering building? By, this is Ed Carpenter's bridge in Arizona. Ed has a wonderful way with bridges. Okay, so we talked about our three bridge types. What type is this? Floating, yeah. Beam bridge, just like an old tree on the water. I took this uh, photograph out my train window. This is, um, I do have a video of Galloping Gertie. You guys know that bridge? What didn't stay up? So this is the second bridge opened in um, 1950, and they put a few more triangles on it. And then I took this picture. I'm sorry, I don't have a completed picture yet, but this year the third Tacoma Narrows Bridge opened $859 million. It's going to be paid for by tolls. Would you guys, what did you guys think about tolls in Portland? You what? You wish we had them? Anybody else feel that way? This one gets us. How many people would vote for tolls? I'm really curious. This is really good. How about sales tax? Oh, no, okay. <laughs> okay, my favorite bridge city. My favorite bridge city. Where is this? It is. You guys, you guys are really good. My third graders don't get this. So this is the Duwamish River. And my husband and I, we stay downtown way over there. And then we walk from the library because we'd heard about this bridge. It's a hydraulic lift bridge. It goes like this and then it goes like this. Do you guys know that bridge? This is a fabulous bridge. Yeah, you what? Yeah, well, there's a high-level bridge up here that doesn't move, and then they have this little one. Look how this bridge goes. All for that little bitty boat. We were so excited when we got up there because bridges either have to be built up high enough or they must move because the river has the right-of-way. The river was here first. He does not pay a toll. His river. This is really why I love Seattle. Does everybody know this guy? Yes, he is, lives in the Fremont neighborhood. He's under the Aurora Bridge, and he just sits there. He's about 16 feet tall. That's a full-size Volkswagen in his hand. Just kind of waits for somebody to keep him company. I think we are seriously culturally deprived in Portland because we do not have a troll. Uh, another big thing happening in the United States is lots of lighting is going on. This is the... Uh, Wheeling Bridge in West Virginia, the oldest suspension bridge in the United States, 1850. Burlington, Iowa, and Portland, Oregon. How many people here know that there's a group called the Willamette Light Brigade that's trying to light Portland's bridges? Two people? Four. All right. Well, there's an independent citizens group that would love to see the bridges 
lighted. Patty Tillett from Zimmer Gunsel Frasca says, it's criminal the way our bridges disappear into the night. So this is the Morrison Bridge. There's a big flap going on right now. I saw an email between the commissioners about whether they're going to let the Blazers put some lights on there. So what do you guys think about capitalism on our public byways? Or, I mean, whatever that word is that they do. What do you think? Good? I, well, I think they pay a little bit. I think that's the idea. Oh, and why I get to do what I get to do. This is downtown Portland, one-third mile between bridges. And the amazing thing is they're all safe, well, sort of, for people to walk on. It just can make the big loop. This slide, you have to, this has to be a perfectly dark room to read this slide, but I just want you to know this is the first Morrison Bridge. And the sign up there says, walk your horses on the draw. What about a car, is it all? And this picture showing the first two bridges across the Willamette. First one, 1887, was the Morrison. Second one, 1888, the Steel Bridge. And here's Portland today. I think I have enough of these, too. These are really cool. How many people know their way around Portland and they know the names of all these bridges? Yeah? Thank you. Welcome. Three, that way. That's wrong. You guys are going to have to share these, okay? Share that with them. Okay. So that's basically this postcard, except for some a few flaws, like they left off one of the biggest vertical lift bridges in the United States. Other than that, it's a pretty good postcard. See where the um, stern wheeler is? Well, what bridge is supposed to be there? The BNSF Railroad Bridge, yeah. So I went into Smith Western, who prints this, and I said, there's a problem with your postcard. And not only that, look at the bridges. They don't even look like what they're supposed to be. And now it's a real problem because there's no tram. So they didn't fix it, so I am. So I have a new postcard coming out. I'm pretty excited about that postcard. So take a look at this city. The city sits on a, a little big curb there, 45-degree curve. If you think about the Willamette River going straight through Portland, it does not. And the downtown on one square mile. And behind it, the Tualatin Mountains. So there was no place for the city ex to expand but to the east side. And today, 80% of the population lives on the east side of the Willamette. And these bridges is how we get back and forth, or are how we get back and forth. Okay? It does. Mine has the Thurman Street hanging deck truss, too. I know what's important on a poster. That's all right. Okay, and so what else is on there? Well, you can see. I mean, this is really good. Because right here, this Willamette River, well, guess what? In the 1800s, that was the only way into Portland. There was no I-5. This was the I-5. And this is an inland river port city, which means that we can accommodate ocean-going deep draft vessels. There are just a few cities like that. And then down here, this is the Columbia, and 90 miles out there is the Pacific. So this really explains why Portland's the way it is and why we need so many bridges. Just talk a little bit as we're finishing up here with some of the in individual bridges. We're going to go up the Willamette. You guys help me out. What bridge is this? Huh? St. John's. Remember I was telling you about the anchorage? Whenever I'm on a suspension bridge, I always want to see. Well, look at the cables. There's that anchorage right there. On the west side, the cables go into the basalt of Forest Park. But on this side, it's a lovely thing. So here's the bridge getting its, uh, well, it didn't get totally fixed, but ODOT did a great job. $43 million rehab. They just finished, Multnomah County owns the movables. They just finished a $40 million project on Broadway. 
Hawthorne Bridge finished a $21.5 million project in 1999. Ross Island, da 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 da. When I'm in the classroom with third graders, I say, listen up, you little taxpayers. <laughs> You're inheriting an aging infrastructure. The first person that I've heard say a very good word about how we might solve this is Ted Wheeler. And he's talking about a bridge authority. So I'm all for that. Somebody to be concentrated on these bridges because these bridges aren't going to be standing up in any kind of earth movement. This bridge didn't get any seismic retrofit. There's that anchorage. Oh, I just want to back up and show you on this slide. See this cable going in here? This cable actually is not a solid cable. It's a bunch of wires. And this is where they uh, take it inside that anchorage and they splay it open so ODOT can get in. This is Matt Kuhn from the University of Portland, engineering professor there. So that David Steinman guy, the one that was hanging off the Brooklyn Bridge, this, this was his idea for a bridge. This is brilliant. So he's got a cathedral going all the way across the river. 1931. So that's the University of Portland right there. This is that Burlington Northern Railroad Bridge I was telling you about. took the swing span out, put the vertical lift bridge in. Guess what? This is the main line of the Burlington Northern Railroad. The engineers, you know how long they had to trade that out? 72 hours. Engineers do amazing things. New bridge coming in, old bridge going out. So here's that incredible Fremont Bridge. Notice no piers are in the water. Bridges always present you know, um, certain features that if you study them, you try to figure out, well, now why'd they do that? Why'd they do that? Because here the grain ships need to turn around. They didn't want any piers in the water. Right here from the bottom of the deck, 175 feet. The only bridge with more clearance in Portland is the St. John's Bridge, 200 feet from the bottom of the deck to the top of the Willamette. So I told you I got to climb between the flagpoles up on top of the bridge before I met my husband. Everybody thinks you have to be married to an engineer to do those things. No, you don't. You just have to be a writer and be willing to get parked on the Fremont Bridge. So we climbed up to the top. There are little uh, holes cut between the girders inside it because you're not walking outside. You're walking inside. You're just kind of going like this and you're climbing through. And there's a little bit of asphalt and you put your feet on the asphalt and then there are railings and you pull yourself up. I think we all ought to be maintenance workers for one day. When we got to the top, 371 feet across the river, and something happened that day that had never happened before. We were dived on by the fastest animal on earth. So when I tell third graders this, they say, cheetahs. <laughs> I love third graders. And ostriches. So you guys all know what we got dived on by, right? Peregrine falcons. And now there are, set, there are peregrine falcons on seven Portland bridges. So that's that catwalk I walked across, 77 stories. And then when you're up there, you're looking at volcanoes. I mean, it doesn't make you feel too secure. These are the peregrines. Look at this guy. I love this one right there. So remember the story about the crap? My book, when I married the construction engineer, and we put this book together, by the way, we took out a mortgage on our house for $87,000 to publish this book because the Historical Society had gone out of business and they published the first two editions. So we felt strongly we wanted to bring it back. And so did Pals because they were calling us every week going, where's the bridge? So I just want to point out that when we put this together because of the construction engineer background, there are a lot of construction photos in this, including, well, this is where we had the first date. You wouldn't know that unless somebody pointed it out. And right here is the crack, and my husband was standing up here on that right thing right there. And they were letting the jacks down, and there was too much stress on that bridge, and the bridge did crack, and this is what the crack looked like. It wasn't a little crack. It was a big crack. It almost fell down. He said it sounded like a cannon going off all the way across the river. So they finally get the approach spans fixed because that's the same way they're building the Savi Island Bridge. It's approach spans first and then the center span, 6,000 tons. How many people 
have heard about this lift. This was the largest bridge lift in the world at the time. 6,000 tons came up the Willamette River, floated it up on the tide, came back down. Same thing's going to happen at Savi Island. Lifted it in place. Largest bridge lift in the world. They had a little over, uh, what is it, like a half an inch of clearance or something. 32 hydraulic jacks. They put the bridge together. So I'm showing you pictures where I take kids up to those bearings. I've been up there twice now when Homeland Security have met us. Pretty interesting times. Broadway Bridge. Notice the granite piers. If you see those railroad bridges, those three swing bridges, they all have them. What kind of bridge is this? Like this. Remember what kind we said that was? Bascule. But the counterweights on Broadway are above the piers. 1913. So when it rolls, sorry about my technology. See, it rolls back and forth on this because the bridge comes up and then it rolls back at the same time to get maximum clearance. This is my husband, Ed Wartman, our dog, Wharf, and he's showing us that when they replaced the deck on the Broadway Bridge, they went to fiber-reinforced polymer, which is a space-age technology, and now I can tell my kids they can go on the Broadway Bridge again. They're not going to die up there because that grating is worn out and was sliding people across. So there have been great improvements on the bridges. Steel bridge, the only bridge of its kind in the world. Bottom deck, 26 feet above the river. Talk, bottom deck lifts up. Doesn't even interfere with traffic. Not another bridge like this. And here it goes. Those two decks together, displacing 9 million pounds. Moves up 90 feet, 90 seconds. Been doing that since 1912. It's really, if you don't walk on another bridge in Portland, you will want to walk on this bridge, especially if you're engineering students. What's really fascinating about this bridge, and I didn't really, I didn't really notice it. You know, I didn't notice it. I tell you, I did a class for art students from PCC, and somebody said, "Well, that isn't one big solid structure. What that is is a bunch of little plates, riveted together." Each one of those rivets took four men to put them in. Do you guys do steady pin connected, riveted, and now high strength bolts? Well, this was the old days. So river walk, boy, the city did something I thought they'd never do. They talked the railroad into cantilevering off a two and a half million dollar sidewalk on the bottom deck of the steel bridge. So you're up there now and you're waving at trains and you're going, wow, this is. Burnside Bridge, big cruise ships coming to Portland. This is the deck on uh, Burnside, the one that's going to be all nice and spiffy. Morrison Bridge, this is the one where I have the permit and I can take people into the pit. Hawthorne Bridge, you see that red railing on the Hawthorne Bridge? This is exciting, this will excite you the next time you go across it. The railing on the, bra on the uh, Hawthorne Bridge was designed at a height to keep horses from jumping over the side. The bridge opened in 1910, predates automobiles. Oldest operating vertical lift bridge in the United States. Magnificent bridge. Bridge operator. And this bridge? I'll give you a hint. When they built it, they right away named it, nicknamed it the Spaghetti Ramp Bridge. Do we know it? Markham, the I-5 bridge. But I'll have to say, you know, when ODOT was building this, there wasn't people just throwing money at them and saying, build us a beautiful bridge. But the backlash to the Markham is that the Fremont Bridge was built. Actually, the Markham looks pretty good with jet boats under it. Don't you think? <laughs> looks a lot better. And the magnificent Ross Island Bridge. So here's what you do. You take the tram downhill. You go to the wellness center. You take the elevator up, and they'll give you a key and let you go out on the garden. Magnificent place to see the Ross Island Bridge. What kind of bridge do you think the Ross Island Bridge is? Just looking at it. Looks like an arch, doesn't it? This is a cantilever bridge. So Lindenthal, the famous engineer from New York, came to Portland to do those three bridges. You know, they've been taking kickback money, and they just had so much money. 
So he had just enough money, really, to do a nice job at Ross Island. And by cantilevering it and not putting a suspended span in the middle, which is what happens with most cantilevered bridges, he got maximum height of the least amount of steel. So at Burnside, he just finished that. But at Selwood, he did a genius thing. He did a five-span continuous truss. This is an amazing bridge, really, statically indeterminate. The only bad thing about it, it's not like the Hawthorne Bridge, where if you'd lose a truss, the rest of them would still be standing up. In this bridge, if you lose one truss, it all goes, all falls down. You don't even want to be near this bridge when it starts going. Busiest two-lane bridge in Oregon. Oh, those are those 1894 girders off the burn side I was telling you about. Little rust going there. It's cracking, but they're paying attention to them. That's the steel sandwich on the bridge. Think about it next time you're going over it. Trusses are out of whack. The piers. Now this is exciting. That shows you how much it's settled because of the land jerks over on that west side. Sorry about this picture. It's backwards, but you get the idea. You see how it's showing the geology of the West Hills. Oh, oh, oh. I think I have something that goes with this. Maybe. I'm almost done, honest. I know it was here. So I'm going to finish up with a poem. Usually I get live people up here to do this. They volunteer to kiss. It gets pretty exciting, I'll tell you. And I make them hold that kiss, too. So what kind of, what kind of a bridge is this? Come on, you guys. This is easy. Cantilever Bridge. It's called Supporting the Divine. A kiss... It's like a cantilever bridge, two lips meeting in the middle, air jumping up and down, vortices exciting the molecules, tension and compression. At such an angle, two hearts can safely walk hope across, no matter how many miles are old the ground. Thank you. That's what I know about bridges. So yeah. Please remember to use the microphone. So uh, a rating of two? That's out of a hundred, right? What does that mean? Like why? How do they get a rating of no, two? No, isn't it really just how do you do that? <laughs> well, it means it's functionally obsolete. It means the turning radiuses don't meet standards. It means the approaches are really lousy to get on it. It means it's cracked and it has steel band-aids. It means the bridge is all worn out. It means don't fall down. My husband says, you're cool up there unless there's a triggering event. So I don't know if that makes you feel better. <laughs> I said, what's a triggering event? So, yeah, yes. Um, I'm actually kind of working on the Selwood Bridge project and I, one of our engineers said that people walking across is more of a threat than the moving mass of vehicles. And I was wondering if you knew anything about that. I don't. I find that hard to believe, but whatever. It's, um, it has something to do with like point mass instead of rolling mass. I don't know. Where? Maybe a lot of people. Yeah, like a parade. Yeah, yeah I wouldn't be up there in any parade. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. Yes. When the Golden Gate Bridge had its 50th anniversary. Yes, and it straightened out. So would never let people on it again in that, those numbers because of the vibration effect. Yeah. Uh, but the question I had is, I'd heard that the Portland Bridge is that, that no maintenance is done in terms of painting because of environmental impacts. And I was wondering if you knew that that was true, and if so, what the implications <coughs> are for maintenance. Well, you saw that first picture of the St. John's Bridge. They actually put a oh. diaper on it, and they did the same thing with... Um, 
the Hawthorne Bridge. So they do get painted. It's just very, very expensive. And what's, what that's about is that the old, in the olden days, they painted them with lead. And so they have to get that lead off, and so they have to contain it. So it's expensive, but they do paint them. Yeah. I was in China last week, and they were building a, a, a bridge right next to this uh, conference center where this uh, large conference is being held. And it will have a noise barrier, I guess a glass enclosed section. And mm -hmm. they were spray painting the steel that will support the glass. And so I was breathing the paint as I was walking by, and so were the workers. So oh my gosh. Glass. Yeah, this idea of being uh, environmental. Scary mm -hmm. it, it, there was this cloud of paint over the convention center. It's terrible, the really. Uh, well, that just, I mean, look at the toys they ship, too. I mean, forget it. Well, I know for the, for the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco, they have a three year cycle where they paint the whole bridge. And so they're yeah, well, that's because the Golden Gate Bridge has a bridge authority, and they get to just keep it all nice, and they give lots of tools to go across that bridge. What about uh, for bridge authority? Um, what about privately owned bridges? Because a lot of the rail, or all the rail bridges are privately owned, so they're responsible. Don't get for, me started on the railroad for maintaining and just don't. doing everything just on their bridges. Don't. So how would that work with a bridge authority? <laughs> <laughs> You're asking the wrong person. I like to be a nice person and not speak badly about things in public. Railroad pretty much does what they want. I mean, look at the Willamette overcrossings. You, I mean, you guys know. I mean, it's bad. Those are the bridges you don't want to be going across. Yes? Most of our bridges have a life of uh, 50 years. So do you think because of innovation and 50 years from now we need bridges? Or was that a engineering mistake that we made 50 <laughs> years ago when we designed all of our bridges for only a 50-year lifetime? Well, I'm such a smart aleck. I want to say, you know, until we learn how to fly, I think bridges are going to be around for a while. And I don't know where the 50-year comes from. I mean, look at that bridge back in Minneapolis. You know, I would rather be on the Selwood Bridge than that bridge in Minneapolis that was designed 40 years after the Selwood Bridge. But what happens with technology? I mean, what I've heard the next... You guys know Henry Petrosky? Engineers of Dreams, The Pencil. I mean, you guys need to read Henry Petrosky, okay? He's so good. And he talks about how... Um, and he's got this book uh, about engineering failures, structural failures. And he says people start engineering things and they forget the lessons from the past, okay? And they think maybe those are some of the things that might have happened around the Minneapolis Bridge because there were some things there that weren't, weren't really done right when the bridge was designed. Henry thinks the next bridges that are going to be in trouble are all these cable state bridges. Henry's got some interesting theories. You know, a lot of them are being built. Cable state bridges didn't exist, except they were started in Germany after World War II when they had to begin rebuilding all their bridges. That's where cable state technology comes from. And now they're being built all over. Everybody's excited. Last meeting we went to for the Selwood Bridge and we to have a cable state bridge there. So when they're talking about the Carruthers Street crossing now being a cable state bridge. So I don't know, is that, you know, did I get any close to that at all? I think so. Adding to that, that in 50 years, any engineer who designed the bridge will probably either retire or pass away, so the liability wouldn't be there. I know, isn't it? I don't like the way this system works at all. Yeah, this dying business. Yes? I was, I was just wondering, I, I mean, there's, uh, speaking of Carruthers Street, they have the, the new east, with the new east side um, trolley streetcar, um, they're projecting to run that across the Broadway Bridge. And I know that it ran streetcars at the beginning of its life, but is there any kind of challenge to retrofitting it? Like Huge challenges. I mean, yeah, the city came, you see, the city owns the streets, the county owns the bridge, okay? So there was talk right after they finished that big $40 million rehab. And the way the Broadway Bridge opens, you know, rolling back like that, 1913, I mean, okay? So, um, the latest I've heard about that is that they've come up with the technology. It's not, it's the weight of the tracks are all right and the weight of the trolley, but then you get them together on that lift span and that creates the challenges. But apparently the city's come up with some scheme that it will not add any weight to the lift span. So that's kind of exciting, really. I think that's what engineers are really good at doing, 
engineers always are, you know, come up with solutions to problems, and that's how things get going. Is like the catenary any kind of a, a challenge? I mean, like to look. Don't get me. I'm not really an engineer. I, I don't know about catenaries. You mean like that droop in the suspension bridge? No, that the, uh, the the overhead wires for the power of the the streetcar, right? Oh, okay. I, I don't know. I just know a little bit about bridges. All right. Um, I guess going back to the lifespan thing and how you said earlier that um, engin only engineers can barely make a bridge that barely stands. Yes. And, um, I mean, Portland's still going to be here in 50 years. We hope it's still going to be here in 100 years. So should we even ha be getting engineers to build bridges <laughs> instead of just, you know, putting a bunch of granite in <laughs> Because every time they have, you know, earthquakes in Central America, the only thing that's left standing is the bridge the Spanish built in, you know, Way 1750. Oh, and know. It's <laughs> that's a good question. I mean, I'm really, I love this. Young people thinking about Portland 50 to 100 years from now. Yes. Bridges over, um, over freeways like that. Yeah, you know, every 200-foot block, that, those are the 50, yeah. I've seen the Seattle uh, Park uh, they've got built over a yeah. freeway, and I've seen one other in, in Phoenix. Is that something that's being done a lot? Is it extremely expensive, obviously? I, I, have, I, don't, has I can't really speak here? to that. I'm sorry. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, you know, Vera Katz at one time wanted to pave that over. I thought that was pretty intriguing. Yes. So we're talking about moving the Save Island Bridge to Thermo Street, to or Flanders, uh, four or five, yes, to Flanders to bridge Flanders. Uh, uh, over four or five. And what do you think about that idea? I think it's a great idea. Remember, I told you that when I did the uh, second edition of the Portland Bridge book, this one, there were two hundred, like ten truss bridges in the state, and when we did this one, there are one hundred and sixty left. I mean, uh, truss bridges are going away. If you want to see a fabulous truss bridge, go up Thurman Street to the Balch Gulch Hanging Deck Truss. Do you guys know where I'm talking about? It's, it's the uh, entrance to Forest Park and the beautiful Hanging Deck Truss. It's the, it's the uh, only pin connected Hanging Deck Truss in the state. So I think for those kinds of things, you must go see them because they're just one of a kind. But because they're in the environment, we don't think about them so much, you know, especially bridges. So I'm very excited when they're going to take a truss bridge and they're going to save it for any reason. Yes? Um, what design type of bridge do you have the most faith in long term? The KISS. <laughs> well, I have one other exercise I would like to do before I go if it would be okay with the people here. One thing I love to do with my third graders is, uh, and I think we have enough room up here to do it, but I would need some volunteer. I particularly enjoy um, engineers. I need six people. Five, actually. Five people. I've got one up here. Okay, this is good. Right up to the front. One more. See any more here? Michael? Yeah, three. Uh, you look nice for this. Come on up. How about you? Yeah. You know what? I'd actually like it if you would come up there. <laughs> I think one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, you come on up too. I got it. So the thing about this is that we're kind of emulating bridge piers, and we've, we're a little off here in heights, but I think we can do it. So I'm going to have you go to, you, we're going to make a circle here. So let, let me undo this. We don't need this. This is uh, the way, and maybe we'll turn the light on, because I think it'd be really good if this got filmed. Is that coming on? Yeah, this is good. Okay, so I think we have enough room here. So what are the forces in a bridge? I'm going to have you go down there on the other side of him. And I'm have you come up here by me. You right here. You're going to be right here. And you over here. Yeah. Okay. Oh, so, what are the forces in a bridge? 
tension and compression, and the other one shear. So we're not going to do shear today, but we're going to do a demonstration here so you can actually feel with our bodies what tension and compression feels like. So the way we're going to do this, we're going to, like if there's an airplane above us, we are going to be in a perfect circle, and our hands are going to touch the shoulders of the person next to us. I'm going to have to move this out of the way. <laughs> this back okay this is good yeah we're, we're good here we're good let's come over this way a little bit yeah all right now the important thing is that our hands be stretched out straight so if you have to back up a little bit to get that position all right got it you got a hold so what would we have to do to make triangles out of our bodies we would put our feet together and this is really key your feet must brace solidly to the person next to you, and you still got to hold. Now, don't start till I tell you, okay? <laughs> so we're going to lean out and let our hands drop down to the elbows of the person next to us, bracing our feet and sliding down. Let it go all the way. Lean out. Come on. You got to lean here. You got to have a little trust, boy. <laughs> Come on. Come on. You can do it. <laughs> what is that? That's tension. <laughs> and we could go to the wrist, but we won't. No. Come on up. <laughs> Okay, so what would we have to do to compression now? We're going to lean in until our heads touch. So hands like this. This is good. Are you ready? All the way. All the way. <laughs> you guys are so excellent. Thank you so much. You're wonderful. Thank you. All right, you guys. If anybody wants to buy books, I'm selling them today for 20 bucks. I feel just like a carny. <laughs> yes, before we go, and we'll thank uh, Sharon one more time, she will be outside with her books uh, at the table. And uh, I want to mention that next week, our speaker will be Congressman Earl Blumenauer, uh, who actually, Sharon brought up a number of points about infrastructure, and he'll be talking about transportation infrastructure investment, past, present, and future. So we hope we'll see you then. And let's thank Sharon one more time. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. So we can talk to me earlier. Thank you. So you want to? Okay. Have some yes, I have some. Should I bring them? Why don't you just bring this box right here? Where does he want me? All right, that's nice. Is the book available in our bookstore? Do you know? You know what? I had, um, if you want.